All right, all right. It is noon on this beautiful fall Wednesday afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this month's installment of our webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about talking about cannabis uh, with your kids. It's back to school time. We're looking ahead to a vote on uh, legalized adult use use here in Maine, and this is a topic that is on many of our minds as we uh, get ready for both of those things. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, we love your feedback. We want to answer your questions, and um, during this presentation, your mics will be muted, but somewhere on your screen, you should see a gray bar, and one of the icons inside that bar is a talking balloon. If you click on that, you can type in your question or comment. Uh, you can make them either private so that only I and producer Ben can see them, or you can make them public so that all of our participants can see them. Um, so again, thank you for being with us. Uh, I am your host, Becky DeCoyster. I'm a co-founder and education liaison here at the Wellness Connection of Maine, and I am joined by producer Ben, who is our digital marketing specialist. He's making sure that all of the IT side of things uh, works smoothly, so and he's giving you all a big thumbs up from his control station uh, right over there. So again, we're talking about uh, talking to kids about cannabis, and there's an art and a science to that. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time on the science today. There's some interesting new research out, um, and, and so uh, I hope that by the end of our session, you will have more food for thought, maybe feel a little more comfortable about this topic and, and discussing it with your kids or kids in general. Um, and we're going to share with you some excellent resources also to help inform those conversations. So let's get started, shall we? Um, I, okay, <laughs> let's get started. <laughs> there we go. Um, so clearly, you know, we're looking at a legalized um, medical marijuana landscape already that has been the case in Maine since, two, well, 2009, and prior to that, we, we started the program in 1999. Um, and in November, we are going to be voting on whether or not all adults should be able to use this plant. Um, and, and certainly that can seem daunting. Um, if you've got kids, it can seem... Um, confusing, scary um, to, to have these conversations, but the news is out there. Um, they're, they're getting messages from school, from friends, from the media, um, and it's important that parents think about um, how they're going to talk to kids about this plant. Um, and two items that we would hope that folks are, are stressing is that healthy kids, and by kids I refer to pretty much anyone under the age of 21, certainly, um, why healthy kids should not use cannabis, and also why some adults choose to use this plant therapeutically, and, and yes, perhaps, if it becomes legal, um, for, for recreational or social purposes. Um, so we will um, we'll, we'll dive right in here. Producer Ben uh, has been gathering some questions ahead of our presentation, and, and one of them that we want to answer or try to answer today is, you know, what does the recent data tell us about youth use of and attitudes about marijuana? Now, we, we know that four states uh, and the District of Columbia have already legalized the adult use, not necessarily medical, but the adult use of cannabis. Um, and, and it's been an experiment that's been going on long enough that we are starting to have some, some interesting data uh, to look at. And so uh, the first thing I would like to share with you today um, are some statistics from the Monitoring the Future survey. This is a national survey that is done regularly every two years, um, currently administered by the University of Michigan. And they've been doing this survey since 1975. Um, and, and as you see here, there are some very interesting trends. So we're looking at, uh, on the left, the percentage of uh, children who have used cannabis um, on a daily basis. Now, that's a that's a. I mean, there's uh, that, that I would think that that's an outlier uh, group, perhaps, who are using daily. Um, and you see that the numbers are are fairly low. And although there was a, an apparent bump in 2013, in 2015 the numbers um, 
are seeming to, to go down or stay about the same. There are not huge statistically significant changes in these rates of use. And this is a national survey, again, um, and, and the numbers, you know, the, the 13 and the 15 numbers are results after four states and the District of Columbia have legalized. Um, on the right, we see the percentage of, of these students who are seeing great risk in using cannabis regularly for anyone, a child, an adult, et cetera. Those numbers are, are declining. Um, so even as there have been uh, some ups and downs and some minor fluctuations in the actual use rates for teens, the perception of risk is going down, and that can scare folks. Um, it seems that you know if, if they think it's not risky, they might gravitate towards it more. They might see it as a, as a safer option than alcohol. Um, and, and that underscores the, the importance of understanding the real risks of using any substance, certainly cannabis, alcohol, tobacco, um, before age 25, it's, it's looking like, from the research, um, that there are uh, there, there is a massive amount of growth in the brain up until that age. Uh, neurons are making new connections. They're strengthening existing connections. And when we tinker with those systems um, at, an, at an early age, it creates pathways for problematic relationships with these, uh, with these substances. Um, Again, the good news being that although they see less risk from using, the use patterns are staying fairly um, stable at this point. And then I also uh, included some uh, charts here. Uh, how many of them disapprove of using it regularly? And these are pretty high numbers. I mean, the, you know, the scale on the left here is from 0 to 100%. And I'm going to bounce back to that previous slide um, specifically the chart on the left, the percentage of those who are using daily, that scale only goes up to 20, right? So, I mean, there's a, there's a you know, if, if this were a scale that showed it all the way up to 100, the numbers of, you know, the, the use percentages um, would be extremely small. So, so be aware of that. Um, disapproval remains fairly high for daily or regular use of this cannabis, again, among um, mostly teens, you know, they, they look again at 8th, 10th, and 12th grades. They, they, you know, do monitoring and checking in those grades. Um, so disapproval is trending down, but remaining pretty high. Um, availability, now this is another interesting point because, you know, as we contemplate, um, well, the fact that we've had medical here in Maine since 99, um, it's, it's more and more available medically around the states and has been for the past 20 years plus, um, you know, there's a concern that, that medical or adult use legalization laws will make the product more available to kids. Um, and we see that these numbers, again, are trending down across the board, across the age groups. Um, and that's, that's interesting. The, the survey doesn't, you know, presume to answer the the why behind that trend, um, but having you know thought about this a great deal, researched it a great deal, and, and been working in this field for as long as, as I have, um, when we legalize the plant for either medical or adult use, that legalization comes with a regulatory scheme that reinforces the idea that we don't want this stuff to get into the hands of kids. Um, you know, it, here in the medical dispensaries in Maine, we, we check IDs. It doesn't matter. In fact, this is a frustration to many of our patients. It doesn't matter if we see you, uh, you know, once a month or once a week. Um, we ask for ID and your valid certification uh, every time you walk in the door. And, and this is the sort of regulatory framework that is available to us when we um, bring an illicit substance into the light that is not available when it's only, you know, on the black market. So um, I don't see much of a real contradiction in, in the fact that although it is more widely available to adults medicinally or uh, recreationally, um, 
teen and youth perceptions of how available it is are actually declining. Um, you know, they, they, you hear it a lot, drug dealers, black market uh, dealers do not check ID. So, um, and one more study, and this, this is interesting. This, this is not something that has, has gotten a lot of media attention, but this is a, a study um, that was published very recently, August 1st of this year, and I checked over the weekend, and it's, you know, updated on NIDA's website. Um, this is current. Uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse is a federal agency that, as you see by their logo here, studies the science of drug abuse and addiction. And they studied, um, you know, teens and, and ass assessed their cannabis use. And when the initial results were posted, when they made, you know, headlines in the media to the extent that they did, um, very often those headlines indicated the first part of, uh, you, you know, the, the bolded part there. They lost IQ points uh, relative to their non-using peers. Um, and it is only recently, actually, that, that NIDA has come back and said, you know, if you look at the study in its entirety, the researchers concluded that, yes, Teens who used marijuana did lose IQ points uh, relative to those who did not, but the drug appeared not to be the culprit. And we're going to dive into this um, in a little bit of detail because I think it's it's important for adults to understand. Um, you know, certainly, as I said, the the neural pathways are still growing and forming uh, throughout the first quarter century of our lives. Um, and yet, uh, these teens who did use um, were not losing, apparently, due to use of cannabis, um, which makes it a little complex when you sit down and, and talk to your kids about this stuff, certainly. Um, I, digging a little deeper into this study, uh, they looked at three hypotheses. So they, they um, you know, the, there's this premise or this belief that cannabis use causes cognitive impairments, right, and, and impairments that last beyond the period of, of being under the influence of the plant. Um, so they, they, they said, okay, well, if, if there is lasting damage done by cannabis use, uh, number one, that use should happen before any of the declines start happening. Number two, those who use more should see a greater decline in cognitive ability. And, and this was very interesting, if there's a pair of twins where one uses and the other doesn't, the one who does should end up with a lower IQ than the one who does not. Um, and so these were three hypotheses. They said, okay, we're going to test these, and if they come out, you know, if they are correct, um, then we can more reasonably conclude that cannabis use causes IQ to decline. Um, moving on, <laughs> they found that none of those hypotheses uh, worked out. Uh, the research that they were able to gather uh, one by one knocked each of those three hypotheses down uh, and instead indicated that both genetics and family environment and, and the, the milieu in which you are raised um, made more of a difference. Um, and, and put folks on a pathway, as it says, that lead both to the use of can cannabis and to IQ decline. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot to, to sort of unpack here in terms of uh, what our, our perceptions of the plant are and in terms of how we discuss uh, with our kids, um, you know, this, this important subject. Um, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the Just Say No uh, campaign back in the 80s uh, gets a bad rap nowadays, right? Um, and, and I think there's good reason for that. Um, it's, it's dismissive and it does not um, take into account kids' uh, innate intellect. Um, you know, Just to Say No, uh, this is your brain on drugs and, you know, the sizzling eggs in the frying pan, if you're old enough to remember those. Um, 
you know, is, is perhaps not an accurate or effective way to deter kids from using um, the plant. Um, how we're talking to them, whether we're talking to them, and, and perhaps some other genetic uh, contributions are, are um, playing a role as well. And the, uh, the research concluded that, you know, even, even if more research, you know, underscores this finding, that, that there is no causal direct link between cannabis and, and you know, IQ uh, going down, um, it's still not a good idea for teens to use marijuana. Um, and one of the researchers is quoted, you know, right there, uh, heavy use in adolescence is not problem free. And, and certainly with moderate to heavy use, there are, there are very significant health risks um, associated with the plant. And this goes to one of the um, really fascinating uh, realities of our endocannabinoid receptor system. And you may know that you know, we have receptors for um, cannabis-like compounds throughout our bodies. Our bodies actually produce what we call endocannabinoids, which are natural analogs to some of the active compounds that the cannabis plant produces. Um, there are many, many of these receptors in our brains. It's one of the, the most dense, uh, densely populated types of neurotransmitter receptor in our brains. And one area of the brain that is very rich in endocannabinoid receptors is the hypothalamus. And it's a little mechanism kind of buried deep in the brain, sits on top of the brain stem. Um, and the hypothalamus functions as a thermostat for our hormones, for controlling our, our endocrine system and some other very important um, systems. And having those receptors flooded repeatedly uh, with, you know, moderate to heavy doses of plant-derived cannabinoids um, at an early age does, can change uh, the development of, of that part of the brain. Um, and so that is just one, you know, it's, it's a very real biologically provable um, fact that, that um, should help to deter uh, young people from, from misusing or perhaps using the plant. And again, these, you know, the, the studies, research is showing us that the brain is always developing, you know, at, up until the mid-20s. Um, so, so although this study did not prove that cannabis is causing decline, um, certainly the researchers are saying, hey, this is, you know, this is not a get out of jail free or, a, you know, we're not waving the, the starting flag. Um, kids definitely should still avoid marijuana and other drugs. Uh, that can that can shape the development of the brain. Uh, you see at the bottom. I hate that it's such a long URL, but um, there's the government website where you can access uh, this this study overview. It came out. You know, a quick way to find it might be to just type in NIDA NIDA notes. It came out in a um, a publication that they do that's called NIDA notes. And if you put in Dr. Eisen's name and NIDA notes, you'll probably get right to that, um, that article. So. so some research is pointing towards, um, you know, at least a, from a chemistry and biological standpoint, um, you know, that, that almost undercuts one of the arguments against uh, youth use. You know, it's not going to make your IQ go down. Well, you still shouldn't use it. And, and we're seeing that in the early days of a legalized framework with five states in the District of Columbia, uh, despite wider access for adults, um, adolescents' use rates are staying statistically within a reasonable uh, range, um, and their perception of how easy it is to access the plant is actually declining. So. Um, another question that we got in came from um, one of our uh, one of our folks who was interested in the in this webinar, and so uh, perhaps they're listening. Um, Producer Ben, can you can you talk to us a little bit about this one? Hello, everybody. <laughs> All right. So I'm a parent and a certified medical cannabis patient. 
What should I tell my children about this? Could my status as a patient affect my parental rights? Can you tell me a little bit more about that, please? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And we actually hear this um, frequently from our members. Um, they get they get concerned. They're they're a little you know, we've we've heard for so long that the plant is you know is illegal and a and a negative uh, negative thing. How do I even begin to broach this? And could being a patient affect my parental rights? These are very significant. Um, questions and so just some some big picture kind of 10,000 foot view stuff um, as we have been talking about the brain is not fully developed until the mid 20s and so you can um, you know have a have a good conversation with your kids um, about that fact and the fact that with cannabis with nicotine alcohol uh, shoot with with sugary drinks um, the earlier you begin a relationship with those substances, uh, the more likely it is that um, your, your relationship can develop into something that is problematic, where you're depending on a substance um, to either numb pain or to um, you know, make you feel good in a social situation. Um, and and it's, it's significant and important for us to talk to our kids about that. Um, it's it's hard to get a teenager to to act now based on possible consequences 20 years down the road. <laughs> it really is, um, and that can also, uh, you know, some folks say, well, should I tell them about my past use? Um, and and that is a very very individual decision. Um, and and I think that uh, as the parent or guardian, you know your kids the best. Um, you know whether your experiences, um, you know, will be beneficial for them to hear about or not. Uh, again, with certainly with teenagers, the risk is always, um, or the fear at least, is always that, okay, I'm going to explain that I used uh, in college and that's going to somehow give them a green light. To, to go out and experiment themselves. Um, and, and that is a very real concern. Um, what, what we would suggest, and many parents um, spoken to would suggest, is that you don't, if you're going to share your past history with the plant, um, you know, obviously you're still here and you're okay, um, but you, you might want to consider um, not only sharing that, yes, I used it, um, but think it through. Um, yes, I used it, and these were some reasons why. And looking back, um, here are some things that maybe I wish I had known or wish I had done differently. Um, and and uh, give them that perspective. So it's not just, yes, I used it. Um, but it's I did, and I've thought a lot about this, and um, you know I I might not do it the same way. Um, these are conversations that you know you you don't <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> call the call the family around the the kitchen table maybe and say now we're going to have the cannabis talk, um, but these are conversations that can come up on the ride home from school or um, you know in front of the TV set in the evening. Um, and, and it's important for us as, as guardians to kids to um, think ahead about what those conversations might look like. Um, and I, I do believe that, that sharing not just your use patterns, but your, you know, from an, from an older and hopefully wiser standpoint, what are, what are your reflections on that? Would you change anything? Um, and and um, underscoring all of this, uh, you know, we do want to be honest, um, but it's not the right fit for every family for a parent to say, yes, I, I used this um, recreationally when I was a kid or, um, you know, or no, I didn't. Uh, that conversation is intensely personal to each family. Um, and we would just encourage parents to, to talk to each other about it, uh, be on the same page if, if you are in a two-parent home or a two-guardian two home. Um, and be ready for it. Be you know, think it through. Kind of have the conversation with yourself before before it comes up 
in front of a TV commercial, um, you know, while you're watching uh, your favorite TV show after dinner one night. <laughs> so, uh, if you are yourself a patient, um, this is this is tricky. Um, you know, certainly if you have a toddler at home, we don't want to have this stuff out in a in a way that or a place that a, a child could inadvertently access it or, or take, you know, particularly an edible and assume that it is something that it is not. Um, so we definitely recommend um, storing, securing your products. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a school of thought that says we don't, many of us in our homes, hide away the, the liquor. Uh, not everybody's liquor cabinet is locked. Um, there are beers in the fridge. Why should we treat medical cannabis any differently? And that's, you know, if, if your family is, is one where, you know, your kids have been educated about this stuff, um, again, that, that might be right for your family. But because the plant is still illegal, because there are pot potential repercussions for kids who use uh, this stuff at, a, at an early age, because of our potential repercussions for parents who allow or, or inadvertently allow access to their children, uh, it is better to be safe than sorry. Uh, keep your products in a secure place. There are um, odor-proof lock boxes that you can um, purchase. There are uh, locking cabinets, you know. Um, if you've made a, an edible product particularly, I mean, and there's th that's really... It's hard to look at cannabis flowers and think that they are anything but what they are, um, and and so certainly they should be locked up or might you know you might want to lock them up, but when it comes to edibles or a, a, an ingestible product, once it's out of its original packaging, um, think as a family about the ways to to make sure that that's clearly labeled that it is obvious that this is mom or dad's medicine. Um, this is not something that you need to get into, um, and and treat it um, in in that way. Uh, same goes for pets and guests. Um, we're we're not good ambassadors as medical patients if if we are allowing folks who don't expect uh, cannabis to be in a product to get access to that product. Um, Odor-proof packaging. Super helps. <laughs> there's there's some really uh, innovative um, security products out there uh, that you can use. Um, people also ask, what you know, what about using in front of my children? I I suffer from um, chronic pain and I need you know to to maintain a certain endocannabinoid level and um, be be medicated um, just to get through my day to be able to get in the car and pick them up from school. Um, Again, that's that is a, an, an intensely personal decision. I think that most of the resources that we have looked at, and, and honestly, most of the parents that we have spoken with, um, do not consume in front of their kids. And and for some of them, that means they have to go outside in the winter and and bear with the cold, um, it, things like that. But but I think that in general the consensus is that using in front of somebody who is underage is not appropriate. Um, again, that, that is intensely personal and your, your personal condition and, and the level of your um, communication with your kids is going to have a great deal of a, a role to play in that. Um, but there, there are uh, external repercussions still, even though medical cannabis is legal. Um, adults who use it and who allow children to get access to it uh, face some, some significant legal repercussions if the wrong people uh, see that or if, if people know that and take it the wrong way. If you're in a custody battle, um, it, it seems that it might just be better to be safe than sorry when it comes to um, using your medicine in a home where there are also children. Uh, another item, you want to always know how much you have and keep track of it. Um, they're, they're crafty, they're smart, they're curious, these kids. And um, 
you know, they, it, it, again, better to be safe than sorry. Um, and, and if we're having these conversations, good to let your children know, hey, I am tracking how much I use. I, I am responsible and I know how much of my tincture should still be in that bottle. Um, and, and, you know, just putting that on the table may help prevent some, some uh, youthful exploration that we would hope to deter or prevent. And finally, talking early and talking often, everybody agrees on this, um, that, you know, having these conversations, making this a part of, you know, just one of the things that our family talks about. We talk about the election. We talk about what's going on in Syria. We talk about cannabis. Um, and, and um, you know, I, I having those conversations before kids are at an age where they're more likely perhaps to experiment uh, is a good idea. There are going to be some resources that we're going to point out at the end of this uh, webinar that can help you get those conversations started. And as one um, substance abuse specialist I spoke with made sure to, to underscore to me, um, she said, you know, it's never too late to start. If you haven't been having this conversation with your kids and they're, you know, 10, 11, 12, it's not too late. Um, it's better to to be there to communicate um, about even these difficult issues than to ignore it uh, or pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, you know, sometimes your kid will bring these things up. Hey, my friend Jeremy's dad uh, uses marijuana as a medicine, you know, so, so it might start with the kids. If it doesn't, Again, it's not too late, and, and we'll have some really good resources uh, at the end of this session. It's important to, to arm yourself <laughs> with, with some facts, with you know, some, some other people's experiences uh, before you go into this. It's nice to feel that you, you know, you've thought it through and you have a, whatever your stance is, that you have a pretty solid grounding. Um, and if you don't know, or if there are things that you don't know, or issues that you don't have a clear opinion on and your child brings it up, it's also important to say, hey, I'm not infallible, but let's find out, our, you know, together. Let's, let's look into this together. There are age-appropriate um, information sources that can be extremely helpful. And then there's the legal, especially the custody um, situations that come up. And Again, marijuana for med medicinal purposes has been legal in Maine since 1999, and yet uh, state agencies, certainly Child Protective Services, um, doesn't have the same view that some of us do of, of medical use, or maybe they don't see the, that there's a bright line between medical and, and adult use or adult use and, uh, you know, excessive use. Uh, one way or another, uh, CPS does respond to reports of child abuse or neglect and cannabis use in the home um, is one uh, sign of that. So a neighbor can call in and say, you know, I, I believe that they are using cannabis or growing cannabis and they have children in the home. Uh, CPS can do home inspections to determine whether to involve the courts. Now, um, I'm aware of a few cases in Maine that, that have involved this sort of thing. Um, there, is, there are, it's certainly happening in other states, um, you know, in Kansas and Colorado, uh, where people have lost custody of their children for what is medicinal use and me medicinal possession of, of marijuana in the home. So it's important to be aware of that. Um, if the situation, if they consider the situation dire enough, they can temporarily remove your children and they can require things like drug counseling, um, you know, drug testing in some cases, before you get your children back. And can't stress this enough, uh, a spouse or a former partner can use your medical cannabis use against you in a custody dispute. I'm not saying it's right or that they should be able to um, but we, we know that human relationships sometimes go bad and, and that custody battles can be um, 
brutal, I, I think is the word, and there are cases of exactly this happening. A breakup occurs, and for revenge, um, you know, the ex-partner calls in the the home garden, um, or in in some cases will use that as a as leverage in a custody battle. There was one case here in Maine uh, last year where um, a spouse was able to win, win full custody, pardon me, <coughs> where a spouse was able to win full custody uh, because, of, because of cannabis use and behavior in the home um, of the other parent. And, you know, that, that story came to us via the media, so, you know, what, what is and is not accurate, um, you know, I, I wasn't sitting in court but what was described were things like cannabis leave, being left out on counters, use of cannabis in front of very small children, um, you know, single-digit aged children. Um, and, and it was, the judge even made clear that it was not the fact that the parent in question was a medical marijuana patient, but the responsibility or lack thereof that was demonstrated um, in the home in terms of, you know, securing the products and using discreetly and not in front of the children. Uh, you see there a, a logo for a national marijuana patient advocacy group called Americans for Safe Access. And they have a great um, resource. Now, now it's California-focused because the group is California-based. Um, but there is some really good information on their website. And you see the link there. And they also are a, a fountain of information and resources. They're um, easy to get in touch with and really great about answering questions and things. So, so one of those really nice resources for medical cannabis parents. So responsible, conscientious use is, is what we're talking about here. Uh, you want to know how much you have at home. You want to keep it safe from your kids. Uh, if you are growing at home, this is important. You want to child-proof cultivation areas, and I mean locks. Um, I mean, you know, it's sort of a, a level of vigilance where, you, where you're not accidentally leaving the door open. Um, when you when you walk out of the the room, um, <clears throat> just to reduce uh, temptation, the appearance of irresponsibility, things like that. If you're a patient and you're cooking with cannabis, you want to label your infused products and you want to store them, if possible, in a childproof container. Um, you know, it, certainly if you've got toddlers in the house, you want to keep it out of out of toddler reach and um, for older kids, you want to make sure that um, there's, there's some access barriers. What you see on the bottom left there is a hemp-based uh, tote storage solution that, that has a lock on it. Uh, it. It controls odor. If you're using flower medicine, um, it's nice and big and roomy enough that you can fit uh, edibles inside it. Um, and we have those available. You can find them online. There are a number of different lockbox options that are fairly reasonably affordable that can really help with this sort of thing. Uh, do not medicate in the presence of your child. And if you are in a dual parent or caregiver home where both adults are patients, it is a good idea, if possible, to ensure that one of you is always ready to, to hop in the car and head up to the emergency room or deal with a phone call from, you know, the, the kid's friends, parents. Um, and these are just kind of common sense uh, safety and preventive measures that, that patients who are parents can take um, to, to use responsibly, to be a responsible and conscientious medical user. Oh, and there's the, <laughs> the title, Stash Logics Eco Stash, and it's made out of hemp, uh, which is good for the environment. All right, so one of the fantastic resources that we found in our research came right out of Children's Hospital in Colorado. And wow, Children's Hospital got some media attention uh, shortly after Colorado legalized for adult use because they, they did say that, yeah, we're seeing more emergency room admissions 
for kids who have gotten into cannabis and adults too. Um, columnist Maureen Dowd <laughs> was one of them who had a bad experience, did not end up in the hospital, but um, certainly the, the accidental ingestion of edibles is probably one of the, the bigger talking points, um, certainly for opponents of medical and adult use cannabis uh, and, and a concern for any parent who is, who is using. And uh, this clinical psychologist, Dr. Kaywood, out at Children's Hospital Colorado, um, put together this fantastic booklet, How to Talk to Kids About Marijuana. And honestly, having seen some of the, the media coverage that was coming out of Children's, um, I went into this thinking, oh boy, this is going to be, you know, uh, uh, this, this won't be very helpful. And instead, uh, it is an extremely sensible um, approach. And these are just some of the call-outs uh, from that booklet. And you see, the again, the, the source at the bottom. But, you know, have a conversation, not a lecture. Um, ask questions, uh, you know, rather than, I, I guess, <laughs> asking questions is always good. Um, but rather than, are you using, um, you know, frame those questions in a way that, that doesn't shut down conversation. Um, removing judgment from whatever your child chooses to share with you is is important as well. Uh, make it an ongoing conversation. Again, not something you talk about once, but this is just, you know, part of part of our society now and, and hey, did you see that news article or blah blah blah. Um, she recommends being honest if you use marijuana. And I that was I think when I when I read that part, my my skepticism about what <laughs> what this resource would be about was were were allayed. Um, it, she goes into detail a little bit about, you know, how, what that honesty looks like. Um, but, you know, be honest if you're using it. This is not something to, to hide. Um, and it's hard to, to give your kids good information about the plant if um, you feel ashamed of your own use. And she also recommends acknowledging if you have a family history of problem drug use. Now, dependence rates, and this is in adults, for uh, cannabis are about on a par with dependence rates for caffeine. About 9% of users will develop a problem, a, a dependence on the, the substance. And that means not that they are physically addicted, but that they will... Um, more psychologically um, gravitate towards the substance as a way to manage problems, deal with life, uh, rather than developing coping skills uh, that are substance-free. Um, if you know that there is alcoholism in your family, if you know that there is other drug addiction or dependence in your family, that is an important um, indicator an important consideration uh, for for anyone in that family to to take into account. It uh, doesn't mean that you can't develop your own very responsible relationship with the plant, um, but if patterns of behavior and thought and perhaps genetics have um, created a, a strain of, of problematic drug use in your family, it's important to be honest about that. And again, these are just four of the top um, takeaways that, that we found in this How to Talk to Kids About Marijuana book. Um, there, there's a lot of other really helpful information there, and we would encourage you to, um, to check that out and, and um, see, see if it's as helpful to you as we thought it might be. Uh, one other thing before we kind of wrap up here, um, you know, the National Institute on Drug Abuse We've already talked about this is a clearinghouse, and they, they do evaluate um, and publish a lot of studies on on drug use, both pharmaceutical and illicit, um, in the U.S. And I just found this a really really interesting um, infograph that that they shared, and it just looks at the last two decades um, of of these you know these three categories, I guess, um, and how, how many folks, how many kids are using them. It kind of summarizes those earlier graphs that we started with. Um, and you see that, you know, alcohol, it's decreasing. Cigarettes, wow, we've done a really great job with education um, and some other 
uh, social controls around eliminating or reducing youth use of cigarettes. And then they lump all illicit drugs together in this, um, in, in this particular graph. Um, but you see that the five-year trend or so is, is stepping down. Again, it's not a huge decline the way we're seeing with cigarettes. Um, but again, when we're talking about medical cannabis or adult use cannabis, um, I think we can look at cigarettes and look at some of the um, messaging, some of the uh, social, I would almost say, well, it gets a bad rap, but social engineering, the, the tax rates that we put on cigarettes, the kinds of um, ID requirements, the penalties for people who um, break those, you know, age requirements. These are things that in a regulated adult use market, we can bring to bear on marijuana as it relates to kids. Right now, um, except for the medical program, there just isn't that sort of, you know, concerted uh, social ability to take actions that decrease the likelihood that a kid is going to turn to marijuana. Uh, but I look at this, the cigarette graph and I even the alcohol graph, um, and I think that um, there's a lot that we can learn. If Maine does go ahead and, and vote to legalize marijuana this November, um, I think that we should take a hard look at, at cigarettes and how we have uh, dissuaded so many young people from beginning that, that habit. So. All right, and one more topic. If you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, the National Institutes of Health, of which NIDA is a part, also runs a research uh, division on addiction, and they are in the process of developing a large, a large scale, and we're talking thousands of participants, longitudinal survey. Longitudinal meaning it's going to go for years and years, decades perhaps, and they're looking at a few specific questions. So number one, they want to know to what extent do drug use or other experiences, as we saw at the beginning of the presentation, experiences like in, you know, your family's economic situation, things like that, um, what are the changes that they wreak in the adolescent brain, and what in inherent brain vulnerabilities might lead to drug use and other adverse outcomes? And they are uh, recruiting, actually, right now. So they're also looking at how different types of substance use interact. Um, for example, we know that using cannabis and alcohol together um, can be more problematic than, than even using either one of them alone, certainly if both are used at the same time and uh, irresponsibly or in excess because of how they interact. Um, so, uh, you know, they're going to be looking at, at these sorts of, of questions. And then what impacts do diverse patterns of substance use, for example, moderate versus heavy marijuana use, <coughs> pardon me, what impacts do these uh, patterns have on brain development, academic achievement, social functioning, and other aspects of life? And um, I would say maybe what impacts, if any, <laughs> do diverse patterns of substance use have? Um, but but they're they're at least looking into it now. We know that this is a federally funded research study, and so their their uh, starting line in terms of their approach to cannabis is likely to be that it is uh, an inherently dangerous substance. Wherever we stand on on that issue, you know that's that's as, as may be. But the research is going on. If you are interested in learning more, or if you have kids who might be interested in becoming part of the study. You can learn more about it at abcdstudy.org. So. All right, and a couple of final thoughts. Um, NIDA, again, <laughs> they also put out a fact sheet. It's instructive to read their fact sheet and then the, the flyer or the booklet from the uh, Children's Hospital in Colorado together. Um, but they do point out that whether or not it becomes legal, it's, it's still not a good idea for teens. Um, and it can alter the course of a young life, um, you know, and, and that's an important uh, potential or possibility to bring up with your kids. 
Um, they certainly encourage having the conversation, even if it's difficult. So everybody seems to agree on that. And one other <coughs> thought as I was uh, checking the, the presentation for today over the weekend and uh, making sure that we, we covered everything that I had hoped to, uh, I ran across this article on Sunday in the Bangor Daily. And the kids themselves are saying exactly kind of what, what a lot of other folks in this presentation have been saying, one-off events and anti-drug initiatives don't compare to the presence of a supportive person in a young person's life. Um, that sense that I have an adult that I can rely on who won't judge me, who won't laugh at me or shame me if I have questions about this stuff, uh, if I have friends who are starting to experiment with it. Um, that sort of stable foundation leads to smarter, happier kids. And again, that's what the kids themselves are telling us, and I think we need to listen. All right, I promised resources, and here they are as we, as we round the corner and, and approach the 1 o'clock hour. Um, the first is from the Drug Policy Alliance, and they are another national group. Um, they <coughs> have a, a fairly, um, well, their approach to drug policy is what I think my, certainly my grandmother would have called liberal. Um, they're, they're, uh, they do a lot of research, they do a lot of education, and as you see here, they have a reality-based approach to teens and drugs. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum put this together. Um, it covers marijuana and other drugs. I mean, we know that kids are out at parties. There's, this stuff is out there um, starting in their teens, sometimes their early teens, sometimes before their teens. Um, and the Drug Policy Alliance has created this booklet um, to, to kind of help parents wrap their arms around the subject uh, before or during these conversations. All of these resources are available free. Uh, so that's, you know, if you're, if you're watching us online, you, you are, you know, one, one new uh, computer screen and a little bit of typing away from, from accessing these and downloading them for yourselves. Uh, another one, <clears throat> the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. Um, this is a, a nationally funded group, and they have produced the Marijuana Talk Kit. Um, and, uh, you know, quite honestly, you're going to get a slightly different perspective from, from the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids than you are from the Drug Policy Alliance, but we, we think it's important to, to have access to and to consider all of these um, perspectives as you are um, kind of educating yourself to, to have the conversations. Uh, the Monitoring the Future survey, the, the very first slides that we looked at with those, with those graphs about teen perceptions of, of cannabis, um, the whole thing is available free online. Um, what you see here is the overview document. They also break it out into, I think, three or four more volumes where they have one that's just about the 8th graders, one that's just about the 12th graders. Um, very helpful, very interesting, full of, full of charts like you've seen here, um, and, and a pretty unbiased scientific look at what is actually happening on the ground around marijuana and other drugs in terms of our teens. And then finally, I mentioned them before, Americans for Safe Access. They put out a fantastic series of guides to medical cannabis specifically. Uh, they are condition specific. This one is the overview guide. Uh, there are also specific booklets about cancer, about glaucoma, and some other um, medical cannabis or diseases for which medical cannabis can be helpful. Um, but this is good baseline information. It helps to, to just understand the mechanism of how the plant works, um, whether we're using it therapeutically or not. When we are using cannabis, it's interacting with our endocannabinoid system, and the science is moving ahead to... Um, give us a much better understanding of, of why and how the cannabinoids work in our bodies. And this is a fantastic free introduction. Um, you can download the booklets, again, right online there. If you have, um, you know, a specific qualifying condition yourself or you know someone who has, they're a great resource for patients who are curious about medical marijuana as well. So we would recommend 
um, any of these these four guides. Also, um, the Children's Hospital Colorado pamphlet that was mentioned earlier. Uh, lots and lots of good information out there. Again, it really does boil down to knowing your family, knowing your kids, um, and getting a sense for you know when is the right time and what is the right amount of information. Uh, you're not alone. There are there are lots of resources out there. If you happen to be the parent of a medical marijuana patient, there is also a group uh, called Parents for Pot. Parents, the number four, Pot, and you can find them on Facebook. Uh, they are very welcoming, and um, I would imagine that they would have some really good lived experience for you as the parent of a medical cannabis patient who is a child, and perhaps even for a pa you know a parent who is not a patient whose child is not a patient but just wants to get a sense of um, how other people approach this important and sometimes difficult conversation so uh, we are finishing up wow it's it, we are in really good shape we've got a few minutes left if any of you have any specific questions again there is a chat box uh, or a chat bubble that you should see in the gray bar on your screen. You can pop those questions in there. You can send them to everyone or just to uh, producer Ben and myself. And we'll give folks a second to see if there's anything. And I'm going to scroll back through these screens in case that spurs any questions for you. Um, All right. Well, Producer Ben, I'm not seeing any questions. I hope that folks have found this um, presentation helpful. We always appreciate when you're willing to take an hour out of your, your day to spend with us. Um, as you go about the rest of your day, if something pops into your head, you have a question, uh, you want more information, you forgot to write down one of these contacts, uh, you know, these resource uh, information contacts. Uh, you can always email us at info at mainwellness.org and we will post this webinar up on our website and our Facebook page within 24 hours because producer Ben is good like that. So thank you so much once again for joining us. I am your host Becky DeQuaster and on behalf of myself, producer Ben and everybody at Wellness Connection, I hope you have a lovely afternoon. Thank you and be well. <laughs>